it's time. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome to St. Margaret Church. We are grateful that you've chosen to join us. So it's time to get started. Uh, we also want to welcome the parishioners via live stream. Everyone wave like that. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Uh, let's start our evening with a prayer as we recognize we are in the presence of God. You will find the prayer on the bottom of the paper that was handed out tonight. Okay. Ready? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Please, everyone feel free. Breathe in me, O Holy Spirit, that my thoughts may all be holy. Act in me, O Holy Spirit, that my work, too, may be holy. Draw my heart, O Holy Spirit, that I love but what is holy. Strengthen me, O Holy Spirit, to defend all that is holy. Guard me then, O Holy Spirit, that I may always be holy. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. My name is Steve Kenny. I'm a member of uh, Fire of Faith, which is St. Catherine St. Margaret's Spirituality Committee, many of whom are here tonight. We are delighted to present you our fifth year of pastoral talks, and tonight, Father Martin is fourth in our series of this season. First, some housekeeping. There are four exits at the back of the church, and one on the side. Bathrooms are in the basement, also known as Duffy Hall. We do have an elevator that, steps, uh, that stops at the church, the parking lot, and the basement. Uh, we will be offering a Q&A and sandwiches and desserts in the basement, also known as Francis Duffy Hall, Frank Duffy Hall, excuse me, after Father speaks. On your way out, ushers will be in the back of the church to accept free will offerings to offset our expenses. Please be generous. Um, and these talks are available on the parish website for the uh, duration of Lent. So tonight, our speaker, Father Martin O'Reilly, has been serving as pastor of Mary, Mother of the Church, Parish, Bordentown, Roebling, and Florence, New Jersey since 2018. Many of us remember him from his time locally. In July 2016, he moved to the Jersey Shore and was named temporary administrator at St. Elizabeth of Hungary Parish up in Avon by the Sea. It's now part of St. Teresa of Calcutta. In October of that year, he was appointed parochial vicar to St. Catherine and St. Margaret in Parish in Spring Lake. That's us. Father Martin was born in County Monaghan, Ireland, and grew up on a small farm. He attended St. Mary's Primary School, Three Mile House, and St. McCartan's College, Monaghan Town. In 1984, he traveled to the U.S. and settled in New York City. If memory serves, he was an itinerant carpenter by trade, which meant like, much like the man he ultimately chose to serve. In 1988, he returned to Ireland and entered the seminary. He started, studied at St. Patrick's College, Turles County Tipperary, which is the hometown of my paternal grandfather, by the way. He was ordained in 1994 and began teaching in Beach Hill College, Monaghan Town. In 2019, Father Martin celebrated his 25th anniversary of, of priesthood. Reflecting on his ministry, Father Martin said, this is an opportunity to take stock and remind oneself of how great God is. Everything that has been achieved is because of God's greatness. So please welcome Father Martin O'Reilly as he presents his talks on Eucharistic Revival. Steve, thank you very much. And to all the organizing committee, it's a, a, always a great privilege and a pleasure to come back here uh, among you because uh, my memories here are great. My experiences uh, very much remain with me. And uh, it's great to know that I still have so many good friends here uh, in this area, not just in Spring Lake, but also in Avon by the sea as well. Um, last year, I'm not sure if you're aware of it or not, not that it really matters that much per se, but uh, Bishop uh, O'Connell had appointed myself and uh, one of the members of staff of the Chancery, Josue, to co-chair what is now known as the Eucharistic Revival. And uh, the Eucharistic Revival was, maybe you've been following it, has been a discussion that many of the bishops in America has been having uh, really since 2019. And uh, the purpose of it was that there was a, a Pew research that had found that 69% um, that seven in 10 Catholics say personally, they believe that during mass, the bread and wine used in communion 
are symbols of the body and blood of Jesus. So for all of us as Catholics, but in particular for the bishops, they found that very disturbing is that like nearly 70% of the Catholics, people who call themselves Catholics, didn't believe in the real presence of the Eucharist, didn't believe that the communion that they received was the body of Jesus Christ, that it was in some way symbolic that it all it was was just maybe, in a sense, uh, a memorial, or maybe even a term that I've even heard used even within our own religious ed classes, blessed bread. So in that sense, though, too, the language is very, very important. So that is the reason why that we, we need a Eucharistic revival and why we need it now. So that's going to be really the, the theme of the talk this evening is on the Eucharist and the whole concept of Eucharist, and where the concept of Eucharist comes from. And truly, it's very familiar to all of us because we partake in it every day. It's a meal, and each of us eat. So just to look at that there as well, the 31% to say that they believe that during Mass, the bread and wine actually become the body and blood of Jesus. So for most Catholics who believe that the bread and wine are symbolic, do not know that the church holds that, that transubstantiation occurs. Overall, 43% of Catholics believe that the bread and wine are symbolic and also that this reflects the position of the church. So what that last statement there is saying, they weren't even aware that the church actually taught transubstantiation. In other words, that the body and blood, the, the bread and the wine, actually becomes the body and blood of Jesus. In other words, it's actual flesh. They didn't think the church taught that. They never knew that the church taught that. They thought that everybody believed it was only symbolic. So obviously, somewhere down, uh, in, 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 uh, the, in the teachings of the church, that somewhere along the line it has been left out, or either it hadn't been mentioned, or either worse yet, it has been taken for granted. And sometimes for many of us, if truth be told, we do that. We even take what we believe for granted. We sometimes, I suppose as parents, and I as a priest, sometimes we feel that whenever they're going to religious ed, surely they're being taught that. So we take it for granted that they are being taught that. We take it for granted that they know that. We take it for granted. And there lies the problem for many of us, self-included. Uh, we sometimes take a whole lot of things for granted. Here, this is just a kind of little statistic, it's kind of one of those little boring things where it shows like that, uh, you know, those who uh, attend um, mass weekly or more, 63% believe in the real body and blood of Jesus Christ. Now, that's 63% out of 100% of those who would go weekly, you know what I mean? would believe in that. And then as you move across, know that 58% of them believe that the church teaches that. And then you have like those who might go monthly or yearly, only 25% believed in it. And those who go seldom or never, only 13%. So obviously, the less time that we gather, the less time that we come together, the less we believe or the less we understand uh, on that front as well. So, the thing is the importance of food. And as I said, really, that um, that's where we're coming from, is that we first have to understand what is the Eucharist. And it is the gathering uh, of God's people. It's a meal. It's the coming together of a meal, or coming together of a people to share a meal. Now, the thing about this here is we have to understand what is the importance of food, or what is the importance uh, of coming together. So we have here that the importance of food is inviting people to eat with you is more than consuming food. It is building a bond between people. It is building a friendships and finding common bonds. Now, the danger here is that because we live in such a crazy, fast-moving world. Many of us are more inclined to grab a sandwich. Many of us are more inclined to stop off on the way home and pick up a carry-out. Many of us oftentimes, like, you know, uh, will just settle for a bowl of cereal because I just haven't got the time, I haven't got the energy, and I'm just too tired. So oftentimes, more and more, we're grabbing it without actually stopping and appreciating it. 
So the reason why I'm focusing on this is that if we lose the concept of the purpose of our own meals, if we lose the importance of what family means are about, if we lose out on the, the, the benefits of us stopping as a family and being able to sit at table, to be able to have a discussion, to be able to find out how are you doing, if we don't appreciate what sustains us physically, then there's a danger we're not going to appreciate what sustains us spiritually. And that's important. So that's why I begin with that, with the whole concept of the importance of food. All right? Now, there are occasions when you will make a point of it. You will say, you know what? I haven't met such and such in a long time. We really should have them over for dinner. Or maybe you've just joined a new club. Maybe, there, maybe you've been in the club for quite a while, and maybe somebody new has joined it. So to help them feel comfortable, to help them feel uh, welcome, you will invite them to your home. So a meal makes a statement. It means a, an invitation of friendship. It also, in a sense, though, too, uh, makes a statement that you and I are possibly on the same wavelength here. So a meal is very important on that front. Uh, eating is a sign of rejoicing and celebrating. We usually do it for baptisms. We usually do it for weddings. We usually do it for birthdays. We do it for so many other things. And we also do it for funerals. But even though you say, well, where's the rejoicing in that? Whenever you come together at a, at a, at a, a repast, you oftentimes go back over the wonderful experiences that you have had with the person that you have just said goodbye to. So in a way, it is a celebration of someone's life, as even though tears may be tripping you, but you still want to share that story. So also, too, it is an opportunity to share not only food, but conversation. Now, there are so many different methods and means to have a conversation, especially in the modern world. It's so difficult at times because if you're ever in a restaurant, and sometimes I am myself, as you can see, I'm pretty well fed, but if you're in a restaurant, sometimes if you look around, and it's sad in one way, but you could have three or four people sitting at a table, and you know what I want to say, and they're all looking at their phones. They're all checking Facebook or TikTok or whatever it is. But that's not just the kids. Parents are equally as bad. Like my own, and I shouldn't even be saying it, but I don't think he's going to be watching this, so I think I can. I'm safe enough. My own brother-in-law, I think he's addicted to it. I mean, it's amazing, like, you know, uh, my sister hosts Thanksgiving, my brother hosts Easter, and I host Christmas. And nearly, unless you purposely say to him, look up, we're taking a photograph. If you take a photograph, he's on the phone, you know? So whenever we look at this here, food can just become that, but it really shouldn't be that. It's about having the conversation. It's about asking the question, which is a very important question, how are you doing? And it's not about being nosy, like, you know, sometimes we say, like, how was your day? And it's usually oftentimes can be a kind of a term or phrase that we say anyway, and we really don't expect a reply. It's a bit like we used to say, when you meet someone, oh, how are you doing? And you hope to God that they're not ill because I have to take the time to listen. And you're hoping for the response, oh, I'm fine, good, move, you know? So meals can kind of slow us down. Meals can give us the opportunity to stop. Meals can give us the window of us being able to look into the lives of others and even into our own lives about asking the question, how are you doing or even how am I doing? Because again, it gives us the opportunity to say, how comfortable am I in having a conversation even with my own kids? I think I may have told some of you this before. I know I probably have mentioned it uh, here at a Sunday Mass leading up to Lent, that for Lent, I give up watching television. It's one of my Lenten things. And how it came about was that uh, way back in Ireland, must have been about, ooh, maybe, I'm going to say 10, 15 years ago, I found now in life everything is decades. Nothing was last year. 
It's at least 10 years ago, 20 years ago. But anyway, 10, 15 years ago, I was driving along this road. I was going from a place. It was in uh, County Tyrone, which is in the north of Ireland, to Fermanagh, which is also in the north of Ireland. So I was going from Clahar to Enniskillen, and I was driving in the car, and this lady was hitching a ride, just thumbing a lift, as we'd call it. And I pulled over, and I stopped, and I gave her a lift. And we just got generally chatting. I was dressed in civvy, so she had no idea who I was. Maybe it was by my accent, maybe I don't know what it was, but then she says to me, how's Lent going for you? And I'm like, okay, yeah, fine. It's a bit strange because in the north of Ireland, there's two things you really don't mention. One is politics or the other is religion, you know? So then I'm like, yeah, it's going pretty okay. What about you? Oh, it's great, she says. Uh, we give up watching television. I says, we being who? She says, oh, my husband and wife and our two kids. Okay, what age is your kids? Oh, one is 14, the other 16. Oh, I said, that should be fun. So how does that work out? Well, she said, tell you what, this is our second year doing it. Our first year, we decided that that's what we would do. We would stop watching television for Lent. So she says, before that, what used to happen is the kids would come into the school or in from school, throw the bag underneath the stairs and say, mom, is dinner ready? No, 20 minutes. That's fine, they'll go into the living room, turn on the TV and watch TV for 20 minutes. Then I'll call them in the eat. So here it was, like, you know, that uh, they would come in and say, Mom is doing it ready. And I said, No, about 20 minutes. And here they're just standing there in the kitchen. And then I'd ask them, uh, How was school? Fine. Then she says, I came to realize here I have these two strangers standing in my kitchen and I didn't know how to talk to them. Because, bar the usual little greetings, I, I, I couldn't talk to them. So then I kind of had to shoo them out, go away and do your homework or whatever, and, you know? And then the week, she says, it was torture. And it came to the weekend, and I remember saying to the husband, we're going to have to watch TV for the weekend, or either some of us is going to kill somebody here. <laughs> so what he did was he went up into the attic and he brought down the board games, and they started playing the board games. And then their friends come over, and they started playing the board games. And then she says, I start to realize I didn't even know who these people were. I knew their first name, I knew they were friends up, but I didn't know anything about them. I didn't know anything about their personality. I didn't know anything about their mannerisms. I didn't realize, she says, my eldest child was such a bully. You know, by the way he was telling people or talking to people. She says, we really got to know each other. And as Lent went on, we were hoping that it would never end. So we now do it every year. And I thought that was amazing that they actually went and done that and then they really got to know each other. Not only to get to know each other, they got to know their children's friends as well and who they were and all about them because the distraction of the machine was no longer on. They had to have a conversation with each other. And the meal, the whole concept of the meal is ideal for that. It gives us the opportunity to have a conversation. We find that with uh, the food as well, is that we have fellowship is more special when it is done over a meal. Whenever you give time to get to know somebody, a relationship is better built over a meal. It's whenever you, in a sense, give the opportunity of, you know, people feel comfortable. Whatever it is about having a fork full of food going into your mouth, you feel a little bit more relaxed about it. Maybe it's just me feeding the belly, but in that sense, though, too. So food is great for fellowship. Like, obviously, what you're going to have here downstairs afterwards, the opportunity to have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or even a bottle of water, a chance to have a little bit of cake, and then you can just have that conversation even with each other as well. It means so much. Then you also have, and this is the, the last part, and it's really a scriptural passage, and it's that eating is a sign of contentment. Jeremiah wrote a letter to the exiles in Babylon. He told them to build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Eating in this case was a sign of contentment and peace. So there's a certain sense of achievement whenever, for example, if you have the opportunity, if you do have a little back garden, or even if you have a little what you would call a vegetable plot, where if you can plant some seeds and if you can pick what it is that you have planted, what it is that you have, in a sense, nurtured, then you get a great more sense of contentment out of it on that front. So just to recap the importance of food, keep that idea in your head. 
because to me, that's the foundation of our scriptural faith. It's the foundation that Jesus built on in his ministry. And I'll touch on that uh, a little bit more uh, as well. Now, we need a little sup of gin here. Sorry, water here. And be fine. We'll be good. Now, the importance of hospitality and how food is at the center of it. Okay? Now, you'll find there in the first chapters of Genesis, we see God's hospitality. Now, we all know the opening chapters of Genesis is the creation of the world. And whenever you think about it, everything that God created was good. Everything. So, God made everything so abundantly good for each of us. So, God creates the heavens and the earth. By doing so, fashions the perfect home for Adam and Eve. And then God provides everything they need to thrive in created joy. So, this is the beginning of, again, that concept of the importance of hospitality and food that God provides for each of us, and everything that God has created is good. Then we also find then in, as well, Abraham welcomes the three strangers. Now, I don't know if you know this. Um, it was just after Abraham and Sarah had left what was familiar to them. It was just after they had left their own home people because they, their own people, were worshiping many, many different gods. But Abraham had come to the realization that there was only one God. And because he had this conversion, because that he and himself and his wife Sarah had believed this, they had to leave home because it was just too uncomfortable. It was a new beginning. So the, even their names, God changed their names from Abram to Abraham and from Sarah to Sarah. So, there was a whole sense of a new beginning. So, here they were, in a sense, nomadic, uh, I suppose, followers of God. They didn't have any place to call their home. So, as you see here, one of the great defenses of nomadic people is hospitality, because, hey, if you have nowhere to shelter yourself, there's not much point in falling out with everybody who comes your way. So, the best way to deal with people that you don't know that well is be nice to them. Is be nice to them. So, here we have this wonderful scene of Abraham welcoming the three strangers, invites them to rest, and allow him to bring water to wash their feet. Now, your feet, believe it or not, were the dirtiest part of your body is because there were no paved roads, there was no sidewalks, they didn't have nice shoes. Many of them were probably barefoot, and so they were walking through the dusty, dirty camel poop-covered uh, pathways. So, a real mark of uh, hospitality was provide water to wash their feet. Remember that. That's going to come up again. The concept of washing the feet. And then what we have here, too, is that the food to restore their strength and for their journey. Now, a mark of appreciation for what Abraham and Sarah, and Sarah did was that they had said to them, by this time next year, you will have a son. So, the message here is that sense of hospitality, that sense of welcome, that sense of uh, nurturing the stranger, giving them food as sustenance, food to help, you know, to replenish them, oftentimes comes back rewarded. It comes back ten, twenty, a hundredfold to all those who show generosity, to all those who show kindness to the stranger and the foreigner. We also then have to Lot, and uh, we all know the, the whole story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and oftentimes that story of Sodom and Gomorrah is, is oftentimes trumped up for whole, uh, you know, people's sexual orientation, and it was destroyed because of homosexuality. And here's the thing, there is a, a, a train of thought it had nothing to do with the uh, sexual orientation of the people. It was because of their inhospitality, because of their, their, their crudeness, because of their coldness, because of their hardness of heart that they wanted to miss, 
uh, treat, they wanted to abuse, they wanted to take advantage of the stranger or of the foreigner. And you see, for the Jewish people, that was an abomination in itself because God clearly stated that He says you must befriend, you must take care of, you must provide for the stranger because God said, remember, you were strangers in Egypt yourself. You wandered the desert for 40 years as strangers. You needed hospitality. You needed welcome. So, in other words, now that you have found yourself stable in your land, the promised land that I gave you, now it's your obligation to show that same hospitality, to show that same respect to the foreigner and the stranger. So, there is a, a, a strain of thought that that's why Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, not because of the, the sexual deviance, it's because of the abuse that horrified, horrified God that abuse of the uh, inability or the unwillingness to welcome the stranger. And not only not to welcome them, but to abuse them and take advantage of them. So no doubt this situation here wasn't the first time that they did this, and Lot knew it because the people that Lot had taken into his home, they were just nicely sitting out underneath a, a, a tree. And Lot had said to them, guys, you need to come in. Uh, they said, no, no, we're fine. No, Lot said, please, you need to come in you have to come into my home. Please allow me to offer you shelter. Please allow me to give you food. Please allow me to give you safety. So he really, really persuaded them and did it because he knew. He knew what the town people were like. He knew what it is that they would do to them. So Lot was rewarded for that, rewarded with his life, and his two daughters were also rewarded with that too, that whole concept of hospitality and food. In Exodus, we also witness uh, God's continuing love for the people, providing for them directly uh, by God's self. God fed them for 40 years until they arrived in the land of Canaan. You know, you know, you know the old story, like, you know, in the sense of uh, whenever they had cried to Moses and said, what did you bring us out here for? What, to starve to death? I mean, our bellies were full with pots of food back in Egypt. And like, I mean, guys, you seriously about that? I mean, you're just thinking of your belly at the moment, but you do realize how you were treated back there? But anyway, you know the old adage, eating food is soon forgotten? So, uh, but God then provided for His people for 40 years. And every day there was fresh food, every day. And God said to them, only take what you need for today. I will provide for you tomorrow. So there's a great act of faith there too. Now, so there was others who didn't quite accept that and did take more than they should have, but yet no, when they woke up the next morning, the food was rotten. There was worms and maggots all through it, so they couldn't eat it. So it was a lesson to them. God will provide. God will give you what you need. God will give you what it is that you will need to sustain you, to nourish you, to strengthen you. God will provide. So finally, we have here in the hospitality of God is also an explicit command in the Old Testament, which reminding the Israel that they too were strangers and foreigners in the land of Egypt. And that was a very, very important thing because it goes back to what I mentioned earlier, is that uh, in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 33, 34, when an alien resides with you in your land, you must not oppress him you will regard the alien who resi resides with you as the native born among you. You are to love them as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. Now, that is a, a, a direct and clear teaching that the Israelites were told that they had to live by and they had to practice. And that's why we go back to the other part there with Lot, that the big question mark is, was it the sin of inhospitality that offended God more? That was the great sin, the, how unhospitable the people of Lot were. And forgetting the commandment of God is that to treat the alien as a native-born child. So, in all of that there, again, we talked about food, we're talking about hospitality, and we're kind of basically leading ourselves up to Jesus and the importance of hospitality.
All that I have just said, Jesus would have been taught that. That would have been the background that he would have been brought up in. That's what his mom, that is what his foster dad, Joseph, would have told him about the importance of hospitality. They would have been told because he would have, uh, how would I say, celebrated the Passover. So the Passover would have been explained to him. So he would have been very, very conscious of all of that as he was beginning his public ministry. So we have here Jesus and the importance of hospitality. Now, again, the hospitality begins from the very beginning, okay, where you have Mary who is greeted by Elizabeth. Now, here's the thing. You'd say to yourself, was it not a bit unfair that Elizabeth was expecting the same time as Mary? Should Mary not have got the whole limelight? Should the focus not have been completely on her? And here is the thing, it's not about who gets the limelight. What it's about is that we share together their journey. Both Elizabeth and Mary were on the same journey, that they were fulfilling God's prophecy. And they were more than open, they were more than willing, and they were more, uh, how would I say, faithful to do that. So they were there for each other, because poor Mary, believe it or believe it not, would no doubt found herself very isolated, very alone. Like, I mean, the law stated that Joseph had every right to stone Mary. She betrayed him. She wasn't married to Joseph. She was only engaged to him. The deal was done. The camels were already kind of crossed hands. So in that sense that then before they were married, then he, Mary betrayed Joseph. But here's the thing, wouldn't tell him who the father of the child was. So Joseph, in his own right, by the law, had the right to have Mary stoned to death, because not only did Mary shame Joseph, but she shamed Joseph's family, and she shamed her own family. So there was a whole lot of shaming going on there. There was a whole lot of hurt people. So Mary, no doubt, would have found herself very isolated, very alone. So who could she go to? And she, that's why it was purposely mentioned that your cousin Elizabeth is also with child. So Mary could go and share that journey with Elizabeth, that sense of hospitality, that sense of solidarity, that sense that God has your back, that God has your back. Even when the world seems to be against you, God has your back. Then we have the birth of Jesus. Now, here it is, this Joseph and Mary finding themselves in this uh, strange and foreign town, knowing nobody. I mean, there was nobody that they could go to. There's no cousins. There was no relations. They had to basically go to a stranger and say, do you have any room? And all he had was a smelly uh, hole in a rock. We call it like a crib. We call it a crash. But really, it was probably a hole in a rock with a piece of wood in front of it, preventing the animals from coming out. That was his maternity ward. That's where he was born. And again, that hospitality. Here you had strangers, you had shepherds. Now, I know for us, we have this perception of shepherds being very nice people, very gentle. Should they look after sheep and lambs and all that there? They were rogues because they were extremely poor people. So oftentimes, if you found yourself on the pathway, if you found yourself on the road late at night, there was a very good likelihood you were robbed. So shepherds were never perceived to be that kind of good people as we perceive them. So they had to find a ways and means to survive, and their ways and means of surviving, not all of them, but a good portion of them, was never always very honest. So here it was, God takes these people whom the world looked down on, whom the world would have rejected, whom the world would have been the last ones that would have invited to the maternity ward to see the newborn baby, they were the ones that came and provided for the Lord. They brought what it was that they needed. Maybe the first foods that Mary and Joseph had in Bethlehem probably came from these shepherds. And then we also know about the Magi and the gifts that came as well. So this, the whole concept of hospitality is very important. And again, it's what Jesus would have been taught, what Jesus would have been told, and he would have stored in his own memory and mind. And then we have the journey 
back into Egypt, again isolated and alone, again in need of hospitality from the stranger. Jesus and Mary became foreigners again. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph became aliens again. They were a total dependent on the goodness and hospitality of strangers, emphasizing again the importance of hospitality and the importance of welcoming the stranger. Okay, so we have then Jesus beginning his first ministry. And I think in a way it's very appropriate that his first miracle is a miracle uh, of kindness, that in other words, he was providing for family and friends, that this first miracle, in a sense, for many of us, we would never consider to be really that significant. It was probably what I would call, I suppose, a pressure miracle. Jesus, they have run out of wine, and he's looking at the mother and like, uh, what do you want me to do about it? You know, he says, my time has not come. And Jesus was like, what am I to do? And Mary gives that direction to the servants and do whatever he tells you. So she had faith in her son. She knew what he was capable of. She believed that he could uh, remedy this situation. So yet and all, for many of us, we may not see it as significant. To me, it's very significant because it highlights the importance of family and providing for family and friends. Again, Jesus' first public miracle was a meal. Jesus' first public uh, entrance into the wider world, into the public world, of what his ministry was about was to the family, to the friends, and the gathering around the table. That is paramount for Jesus. We also have then this here, Jesus' table ministry, which I think is wonderful because something else I'm going to talk about at the very end, but it's where people feel most comfortable is sitting at their own kitchen table. It's their territory. It's their domain. So, and Jesus was very much aware of that. He knew that he had to get out of the temples. He had to get out of the synagogues. He had to meet people where they were at. And that's where he had his most honest conversations. And that's where, in a sense, you'll find here as well, the meeting people where they were most comfortable was an, uh, an art for Jesus. In the following uh, scripture passages, we will see how Jesus best uh, reached his listeners. So you have in Matthew chapter uh, 9, verse 9 to 17, you have Mark um, there as well from chapter 2, 13 to 22. And then you're also there as well of Luke chapter 5, 27 to 39. And really, that there is the call of Matthew, having dinner in his home. And that was very significant because Matthew, as we know, was a tax collector. Even today, we don't particularly like tax collectors. We try to avoid them like the plague, but they always get you in the long run anyway. So, but they were a little bit more despised than our tax collectors today because oftentimes they were extremely dishonest and there was no one that the ordinary person could go to to complain because the Romans didn't care. As long as they got their cut, whatever it was a tax collector took for themselves, have at it. And uh, so in other words, they were despised not because they were just dishonest, but they were dishonest, but also collecting taxes for the occupiers, for the Romans. So they would find themselves very isolated, and they found themselves in a very small circle. And here was Jesus sitting at the table with them, in their table, in their kitchen, eating their food, and Jesus was sitting with them. Now, we do know that obviously Jesus had a major impact uh, on the on the life of, of, of Matthew. Why? Because Matthew became one of his disciples. He left what was his life. He left what was his livelihood. He left what was familiar to him and followed Jesus. So whatever conversation was had at that table, whatever it was that was uh, said over the breaking of that bread, it changed Matthew's life. 
and no doubt possibly the lives of many other of the tax collectors also. Now, we're not aware of that, but no doubt it did probably change. They may not have stopped being tax collectors, but they may have become more honest tax collectors. So, in that sense, though, too, that this is Jesus' ministry. But also we'll find as well the Pharisees and the scribes, the established, those who like to preach in the temples and in the synagogues, they were quite, um, I suppose, critical of Jesus about the fact that he was eating with tax collectors and sinners. And then you have this wonderful line of Jesus whenever he said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. So Jesus has come for those who are hurting. Jesus has come for those who are broken. Jesus has come for those who have been discarded. Jesus has come for those who have been pushed to the peripheral, for those whom establishment had decided that they were dead wood, they were of no use, let it wash away. Those were the people that Jesus came to, and that's why he sat at their table. That's why he sat and listened to their story, and that's why he helped them to come to realize that God loves them. We also find then, too, is that uh, in Matthew there as well, or in Luke, uh, in some of the Pharisees, the woman that washes Jesus' feet. Do you remember I'd mentioned earlier about how Abraham, whenever the three strangers, he said, please let me provide you with some water to wash your feet. And as I said, your feet was possibly the most dirtiest part of your, or your body. So the fact of just bringing a bowl with water was very kind. We find in this situation here, now again, the Pharisee had invited Jesus to his home, and he thought in a sense, though, too, that he might be able to either A, get a better understanding of Jesus, or B, maybe to, to teach Jesus something, or C, to see was Jesus a fraud. Because if Jesus was the Messiah, if Jesus was this Holy One from God, the Pharisee said, he would have been able to recognize how sinful that woman was, and he wouldn't have let her next nor near him. And then Jesus chastises the Pharisee. He says, whenever you invited me to your home and I came, he says, you never offered me a bowl of water to wash my feet. She has washed my feet with her tears. You never offered me anything to dry my feet with. And says, she has dried my feet with her hair. And then he gives them a parable. And the parable he gives them, he says, there's two guys who were in debt to somebody. He says, one owed 50 bucks, the other owed 5,000 bucks. And he says, both were forgiven because they couldn't pay back. Both were forgiven. He says, who would have been happier with that forgiveness? And he says, well, possibly the, the guy who owed 5,000. He says, well, she has sinned greatly, but her, all her sins have been forgiven. So she's the happier one. So again, Jesus took an opportunity at a meal. He took the opportunity in that safe environment to be able to give a message, to be able to give a lesson, to be able to give God's message of love, that it's those who have sinned a lot, who seek God's forgiveness, receives it the most. God is so forgiving, and that experience happened at the table. And that's what I talk about Jesus' table ministry. We also find there, too, Jesus chastises the Pharisee for their hypocrisy. And, you know, again, you can look this up yourself, but that is Jesus' method of being critical and yet not teaching approach, is to help them to recognize that you're, you're saying one thing but you're not living by it. And he says, that's what the people are seeing. I remember whenever I was in seminary, there was a, um, a professor there, and he was great. He had lovely lines that he had come out with every so often. But I remember it was coming to the end of the year, and we're going off over the summer. And he just said to us, now lads, remember this. You may be the only Bible that people will ever read. And he says, be careful what you write on the pages of your Bible. And I thought it was a very powerful statement because us as Christians, and I mean, we call ourselves Christians, there are a lot of people, even those who are within our own family, look at us and say, well, if you call yourself a Christian, 
what I'm reading on the pages of your Bible isn't very Christ-like. Like even Mahatma Gandhi said it. He said, I love your Christ, but I don't like your Christians because your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And again, a very powerful statement from someone who wasn't Christian. He could see the beauty of Jesus, but he found it very difficult to find it in the Christians. And this is the message that Jesus was getting across to the Pharisees. You speak about God's love. You talk about God's law, but you're not very good at keeping it yourself. So again, then we move to preparing the people for the Eucharist. So we have this whole journey of the importance of food. We have this whole journey of the importance of meal. We have this whole journey of being able to have what you'd call, uh, you know, kitchen table ministry. So then Jesus is going to up it a notch because he knows food is so important. We know that too. If we didn't eat, we'd die. So food is so important. But it's not just about the eating of the food, it's about the sharing of the food. That's what makes food really good, okay? It's the, fa- it's the people that you're sharing it with. It's the conversations that we have over it. It's what, in a sense, when a friend calls us up and says, do you want to go for a meal? It's not so much the food. You can have steak anywhere. But steak with a good friend is brilliant steak, you know? It's like you can have a bottle of wine and open it yourself at home but a bottle of wine shared with a couple of friends is the best bottle of wine in the world. It's where you catch up on the story. And Jesus was very conscious of that. So that's why he's bringing it then to preparing the people for the ultimate meal, preparing the people for the ultimate food, preparing the people for the ultimate gift from God of Christ's body. So we have here then, obviously, the beginning of it is in John chapter 6, verse 1 to 14, is the feeding of the 5,000. We also have the feeding of the 4,000. But that concept of feeding, and all they had was, what, five loaves and two fish. Now, in all truthfulness, you'd be saying to yourself, how is this possible? But again, it goes back to the ultimate statement that everything is possible for God. We've seen it earlier for those 40 years that the, that the Jewish people spent in the desert, that God provided them for food every day. He didn't give them an abundance of food that they would store for a week. He said, no, no, I will provide for you every day. Have faith that I will give you what you need every day. And here it was there too that Jesus said, listen, what meager offerings you have God can do great things with it. Many of us oftentimes sell ourselves short on that. We think, well, what do I have? I mean, what could I possibly give? I mean, I'm living on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, what would you call a a limited pension. I just get the same amount every month, but I have the same amount of bills. What can I do? And I think this is a great statement that Jesus is making. He says, it's what little we have combined together as a body of people, as a family. If we all give what little we have, then we can feed the thousands. And Jesus was trying to get the message across, I don't want my followers to be thinking as individuals. I want us to think as family. I want us to work as family. I want to be able to, in a sense, create a a heaven here in this world as a family. So if we all work together and share together, we can feed the thousands. Then we also have that um, very uh, wonderful piece of scripture from, from John. Oh, you're missing a page here. Yeah. Is that very truly I tell you, you are looking for me. This is, after the, this is the day after the feeding of the, the 5,000. This is the day after. So the people were coming to Jesus. But Jesus was very astute. He knew that oftentimes, yeah, many of his followers weren't followers of Jesus because of the message that he was delivering. Many of his followers were there like, uh, Jesus, can you do something for me? So it was a kind of like Jesus was what you'd call a 911 service. You know, I have a bad back, Jesus. Could you fix that for me? So, in this sense here, so Jesus knew that. 
So he says, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. He says, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. I am the bread of life. That was Jesus' statement to them. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I am the bread of life. So Jesus isn't here to fix your bad back. He isn't here to help you with your tennis elbow. He isn't here to improve your handicap at golf. That's not what Jesus is for. That's not what he's about. Even though I've no doubt I've been with a few golfers, they do call on Jesus quite a lot on the golf course. <laughs> Why, I don't know. As a, is he the caddy or what? But that's not his role. That's not his purpose. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. So we know what food is, and we can appreciate what food is, if we can appreciate what food does for us, then we can appreciate that statement that Jesus is my spiritual food, and I will never go hungry, and I will never thirst if I allow myself to continue to believe that. I will never go spiritually hungry. I will never go spiritually thirsty if I accept that Jesus is my bread of life. Here's a long one. And he says this as well because now he's been more definitive. He's been very direct in saying this. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He couldn't say it any clearer. He couldn't say it any more plainly. He's saying, you must eat my flesh. You must drink my blood if you want life in you. And that's why we go back to the very, very beginning, which is so disturbing, is that whenever we come here to celebrate the Eucharist, if we only see it as symbolic, or in some other denomination to see it like as uh, we in the Catholic is uh, transubstantiation, that it is the actual body and blood of Christ, that that wafer is no longer a wafer, it's the body of Christ, that wine is no longer wine, it's the blood of Christ. Where you have consubstantiation is that, yes, for the moment that we're gathered here, that is the body and blood of Christ, but still wafer, still wine. Or, and some people that do see it as memorial. For us as Catholics, there is no confusion. It's the body and blood of Christ. Because Christ himself has said it, you must eat my body and you must drink my blood. And there's no other way of doing it but physically doing it. And he says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Now again, he's telling all of this here because Jesus knew what was going to happen. He knew what was further down the road. He knew that whenever he was persecuted, whenever he was crucified, whenever he was killed, it would be devastating to his disciples and his followers. Devastating. And he knew that he needed to reassure them that I'm going to give you something that will be me. That's why we build up to the Eucharist. That's why we build up to the Last Supper. That's why when Jesus had his disciples gathered around, he physically took the bread, physically gave it to them, physically said that this is my body, take it and eat it. If he wanted to be symbolic, if he wanted to be something that they just remember, he didn't need to give it to them. He just sort of said to them, watch what I'm doing and replicate it afterwards. He didn't say that. He said, take this, eat this, 
this is my body. So Jesus, again, was very direct. He was very clear. He was very purposeful in what he was saying to them. Take this and eat this. This is my body. And do it again and again and again. Do it. Because you know why? After this moment is over, there will be another crucifixion. There will be more persecution. There will be continued hard times. You're going to need sustenance, not just for this moment, but you're going to need it forever. And it's not just them, but every generation of Christians afterwards. Like, think of the people of Ukraine at the moment. My goodness, do they not need sustenance? My goodness, do they not need the body and blood of Christ? Do they not need someone to have their back that will help them through this most difficult of times? And that's what the Eucharist, that's where it comes into its own. Not for us comfortable people here, like, I look at my life and I'm thinking, Martin, you are so privileged. I am. I haven't experienced persecution. I haven't experienced what others have experienced. I have been very, very lucky. So, does the Eucharist really resonate then with me? And that, I have to shamefully say, probably not. Because the Eucharist was born out of persecution. The Eucharist was born out of suffering. The Eucharist was born out of death. And that's when it really comes into its own. It's whenever we do feel our, our backs are up against the wall, that's when Christ says, if you eat of me, you will never go hungry. If you drink of me, you will never thirst. That's when the Eucharist comes into its own. So, the Eucharist. This is the Last Supper. This is when Jesus gathered his disciples this is when he got them all together. And as I said, he was very clear, very direct in what he wanted to say. He said, take and eat. This is my body. And he says, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then with heaven and Mark, take it. This is my body. This is my blood, which is poured out for you. And even in Luke, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So the Eucharist, the focal point of prayer. So again, I'm just moving on, is that now that the same, here's what this is after the crucifixion. This is after the death of Jesus. So, as I said, you can imagine the devastation. You can imagine that sense of hopelessness. You can imagine that sense of abandonment. Like, here you had a lot of these disciples. None of them were theologians. None of them had went to theology or seminary. Many of them were carpenters. They were fishermen. They were just local tradespeople. So, they had abandoned all that was familiar to them to follow this man, Jesus, and he gets himself killed. Bummer. So here are these two fellows on their way home, thinking, what was it about? What do we give up everything for? I mean, can't believe, like, I mean, we give up everything to follow Jesus, and he didn't resist. He didn't put up a fight. He didn't, these, these angels of heaven didn't come down and defend him. And then as they were debating this and talking this, this stranger comes up among them and says, what are you talking about? And they look at him, what do you mean, what are we talking about? What happened in Jerusalem? And he says, what happened? What, are you the only person on the planet who just come in from Mars? About this man, Jesus, that they crucified? So he started to unfold the Scriptures for them. He started back, and they were listening and then it came to the evening, and the, he was going to walk on. He said, no, no, come in, come in. Hospitality again to the stranger. Provide shelter. Give a safe haven. So they convinced him to come in, and he came in. And then what happened? He broke bread with them, and the scales fell from their eyes. The Eucharist was the light. The Eucharist was what brought them to the realization that Jesus was with them. And they could, wow. They just, once they realized, once they accepted what was happening, their hearts were filled with joy. They were just completely overwhelmed. So much so to the point, remember our shepherd story earlier? 
They left there in the middle of the night practically to walk the whole way back to Jerusalem where they could have been mugged 10 different times by 10 different uh, shepherds, but they couldn't contain themselves. And they went back and said, yeah, this is what happened. Can we, and it's unfortunate again, but we don't really truly appreciate what it was that they experienced, but I'm hoping some of you have. I truly hope that some of you at somewhere in your life, even though it's a story just for you, and I've no doubt God does that. He, God does give us our own personal experiences just for us. Even though we try to explain it to others and, we'll, and others would look at us as if we had two heads and what? It wasn't meant for them. But it was meant for these two disciples. And they were filled with joy. There was no going back. There was no going back to fishing. There was no going back to carpentry. There was no going back to herding goats. They became disciples and they became preachers. And that's what they were doing. So, then we have, um, as I spoke about that, then they were continually devoting themselves in the past. So, the Eucharist became very much a part of prayer. People would meet in their own homes, they would break bread, they would offer it up. And they were trying to probably come to terms with what it was that they experienced, but also to try to formulate the Eucharist. What way should it be celebrated? How should it be celebrated? Who should celebrate it? So, like all of that, you have that concept. Then you have this here, the Eucharist, the beginnings of division. There's always divisions. Us human beings, we love to fall out. It's a part of our nature. Because even Paul gets on a rant. He says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. In other words, you can't say that, oh, I believe in Jesus on a Sunday, but I'm going to screw you out of all your money on a Monday or I'm going to take advantage of you because of your frailty or weakness so as I can possess your home or steal your car. So in other words, he's saying, Paul is making that clear. Whatever it is that you celebrate on the Sunday must be reflected on the Monday. So he says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we not stronger than he? Are we? No. So Paul was making, he said, listen, the Eucharist must, in a sense, be lived out throughout our week. People must see the Eucharist in action on a Monday, especially those who are not Christian, especially those who have no faith. We are meant to take the Eucharist. That's why we consume it. We become tabernacles. Do you think of yourself as that? Whenever you receive the Eucharist, at the Mass, do you see yourself as a tabernacle? For example, when you would come in here, you would genuflect before the tabernacle. You accept that Christ is physically present. Do we see ourselves as tabernacles? And we should. Christ dwells physically within us. Once we receive that Eucharist, then Christ physically dwells within us. Then also then too is that we have this concept as well, aren't we great for this, but People were coming and they were using it as a party. It was an opportunity to, you know, um, stock up on a big shindig, have a, a big meal, and getting drunk. And Paul lashes out at them again. He says, listen, guys, have you not got houses of your own to eat and get drunk in? That's not what the Eucharist is about. The Eucharist is about recognizing the needs of everyone and sharing together. The Eucharist is a meal of faith, not a party to get drunk at. It's the meal that unites us all. So, celebrating the Eucharist today, and I'd be happy to know that this is the last slide. <laughs> Prepare, adore, receive. Celebrating the Eucharist today, and as I said at the very outset about the whole concept of the meal, is that oftentimes we are inclined to uh, grab a sandwich, we're inclined to, you know, take a bite, we're inclined to take home a carryout or call ahead and have it ready for us. Sometimes we do that with Mass as well. We stick it in. We're going somewhere. What time's the earliest one? Oh, there's earlier over there. We'll grab Mass over there. Have anybody ever used that term? We'll grab Mass over there. 
you know. So sometimes we do that with the Eucharist as well. We grab it. And really, it shouldn't be grabbed. It shouldn't be stuck in. It's not something that we just have a bit of and then run. The summit of our week is the celebration of the Eucharist. That is the statement. For us as Christians, that is the statement. The summit of our week is the celebration of the Eucharist. Preparation is a daily event. Family prayer, personal prayer, reading the upcoming Sunday Scripture readings. We should be making that a part of our weekly um, program. As we do every morning, we, we go into the bathroom, we throw water on our face. Maybe the last thing you do at night before you go to bed is you brush your teeth. You just do that. You might miss it every so often, but you generally do that. This should be the same thing. Prepare. Not just to come rushing in at two minutes before. And listen, there are many reasons why people come late. All genuine reasons. We've got a flat tire. The youngest just wouldn't stop crying. The second one went outside and got itself all covered in mud, had to rechange it, everything. There's a whole lot of reasons why people come late. There's no judgment. But we should always prepare. We should always try to be there. And as I said, it is preparing daily event. Family prayer, do we do that? Do we actually carve out, maybe, for, and I used to say it back over in uh, Bordentown, I says, you have those missalettes, I said, take them home with you. I says, I don't mind. I, I really, they're not that precious. Take them home with you. And I says, maybe on Tuesday, read the first reading with your family. Maybe on Wednesday, read the second reading with your family. Maybe on Thursday, read the gospel with your family. Have a little discussion. And I says, I'm going to be nice to you. I'm giving you Monday and Friday off. <laughs> so how, I mean, couldn't be better. So even I says, if you've just done that much of reading the first reading on Tuesday, the second reading on Wednesday, and the gospel reading on Thursday. In other words, you're mentally prepared whenever you're going, because you will have your own ideas of what it is that God is saying to you. You will have, you will have God's voice already in you from that Scripture. And who knows, the Mass on Sunday, it might just confirm the message that you've been given, or you might just get a different message. And the message mightn't be for you at all on Sunday, but that's fine. You've already had the thoughts in your own head anyway, because Sunday wasn't the first time you heard it. So it is, you will already have that familiarity. The second thing is adore. Develop the discipline of personal prayer. This is separate in a way from family prayer or just your usual little night prayer, morning prayer. Develop personal prayer. Try to find a half an hour, at least two to three times a week, where you can sit with your scripture, where you can sit with your uh, rosary, where you can just sit and to build that up, and preferably before the Blessed Sacrament, in the physical presence of Jesus. And because you have received Jesus within you, let the two connect. Let the body connect. The body that you have received in you from the celebration of the Eucharist and the body that remains in the tabernacle. Let the two connect. A bit like a magnet. Let them draw you in. So try as far as possible to before the Blessed Sacrament. Make, making Scripture part of that personal prayer and finding a supportive prayer group or a spiritual director. Prayer group would be good. If there isn't one, create one. Surely you can have a conversation with someone, say, listen, would you like to come and we'll join for a half an hour for prayer? Would you like to come? We're just going to read the Sunday readings. Would you join us? It doesn't have to be all male. It doesn't have to be all female. It can be a mixture, or it can be. But try to find that support network, because that's what Jesus did at the Last Supper. He got his own team around him and said, guys, you need to be a support to each other. That's why he said to, people, to Peter, to feed my uh, lambs, to feed my sheep, and to care for my sheep. I want you to, 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 to protect them. I want you to bring them in. I want you to, to be able to sustain them. We still need that. We still need to be sustained and supported and receive. Receive Christ in the Eucharist at least once a week. More when you can, but never as a quick takeaway. What I mean by that is that if you're driving down the road, oh, 
It's 20 to 8. Mass was at 7.30. I'll just jump in here, and I'll grab Jesus, and then I'll head off down the road again. Sometimes that happens. Listen, Jesus is not going to be offended, but don't let it become a habit where you grab Jesus and run. Because we do that. We're living in a world, and we oftentimes morph into that world, and we allow the world to, in a sense, consume us and demand of us. We're actually, believe it or not, we may not like the word, but we're very much slaves to the world. We are. We're very much slaves to the world. The world dictates to us how we should live. For example, the Mount, they say now there is more shopping done on a Sunday than any other day of the week. We have succumbed to that. And that's how Jesus is grabbed and ran off with, you know. So, the last one is to receive. Receiving Christ in the Eucharist at least once a week, more when you can, but never as a quick takeaway. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Father. Uh, on behalf of everyone here, and especially our committee, thank you for coming tonight, giving such an inspiring message about the Eucharist, the source and summit of our faith. As a token of our gratitude, Pat Giles would like to give you this beautiful flower, a card, and most important for you, her homemade cookies. <laughs> Not And everyone else here, we hope to see you all downstairs for sandwiches and dessert. Good night, God bless, safe home.